All right, well, thanks, Royd, and thanks, everyone, for having me back. Um, as I said, my name's James. I'm a medical student, also involved in startups and that kind of thing. Um, I picked the title of the presentation before I realised it was actually going to go on YouTube or on the internet somewhere, so hopefully this doesn't count against me in future investment rounds with VCs. But um, basically what I'm going to talk about is different routes of funding for startups, not because I'm particularly an expert on it, but just because it's been our total focus for the last 12 months. We've been around VCs, angel investors, and ultimately decided on crowdfunding. We're in the middle of our campaign at the moment. Um, it's going fairly well. So I'm going to share with you some of the sort of tips that we've learned, things that we think we've done well, things we wish we'd done a bit differently. Uh, if anyone wants to sort of ask particular questions at any point, just shout out or stick your hand up. That's fine. I'd rather have it a bit dynamic and off-piste. Uh, so basically, my company is called SignUp. We're an online education platform. We take insights from neuroscience and ed educational psychology about how the brain stores and consolidates information, build these into algorithms, and then use it to enhance the way students and professionals learn. So we came up with the, we came up with the idea, my co-founder and I, when we were looking for a better way to study ourselves. The medical course, like most other courses, involves a lot of staring at a textbook and reading it over and over again until you've memorised a particular chapter. Uh, then people go into the exam are totally horrified and surprised when they fail because obviously when you actually ask them the questions or when you're actually in front of a patient or a client or whoever it is, you can't retain that information or you can't get it out of your head because you've learnt it in such a static format. So we built SignUp. It lets people write their own quiz questions which um, consolidates information and helps it be stored in a more effective way. And then we use space repetition and other um, sort of intelligent algorithms to send it out to them at the right time. And we also include social elements to let them share it with their friends, let them compete online and build up a bit of a reputation. So similar to the Stack Overflow model, people can produce content and then become a bit of an authority in the field for it. Me, I might as well delete this slide because Lloyd's pretty much covered it. Uh, my previous company was Jump In. It was a student taxi booking and sharing um, service. We raised uh, 50000 on Crowdcube and then sold it a few months later, which was great. It was the first thing that got me involved in startups and this whole world of things. So about two weeks after doing that, I was itching to get back in the game. And I've already said we're sort of two weeks into our crowdfunding campaign at the moment, 75% funded. So things are looking quite good, but we need a bit of an extra push. Um, this is our page. As you can see, we're not quite there yet, but we've got some of the way. When I agreed to do this talk, we thought it would have been finished by now, but things held us up. So two weeks from now, check our page out. If we've not met our target, just disregard everything I've said for the last half hour. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, you heard it first. So basically, I'm just going to talk around this topic. What is the best way for early stage tech companies to raise seed funding? Um, just out of interest, is anyone considering doing crowdfunding or just raising investment in general at the moment? Uh, cool, quite a few people. Do you want to just shout out or say anything, anything you particularly want to hear, learn about? No, just general. Cool. Why crowdfunding? We've looked at loads of different investment options and ultimately we decided on crowdfunding for a number of reasons. Firstly, it is a good way to validate your idea you're actually putting it out to the crowd and the crowd consists of a whole range of different investors as well as people who wouldn't traditionally class themselves as investors. So we've had 10, 20, 50 pound investments from you know, members of our target audience or existing users of SignUp, which is a good show of faith. It's also exposed it. So our pitch has had something like five to 10,000 views in the two weeks that it's been on. We've had people posting questions. We've had people emailing us and we've, We've actually done a couple of sort of small pivots based on what people are saying because you're getting advice from people who are accountants, lawyers, investors, uh, entrepreneurs themselves. People's advice that you would usually be paying for in any other context, but you're getting it for free just by merit of having your idea out there on crowdfunding. I think one of the reasons that crowdfunding is getting more popular is the, the, tri the typical size of angel rounds and of seed rounds is increasing. Um, over time, just as companies are looking to go bigger and grander to compete with their competition, it's sort of like an arms race. But angel investors themselves don't necessarily have more money to put into companies. So I think, I mean, just personally, we've got to a point where it's more and more difficult to raise seed investments with one angel investor. 
it's going to be out of their limit of, say, uh, 50,000 or 60,000, whatever their standard amount is. So crowdfunding is basically a way of getting multiple angel investors, as well as some private equity firms and some people who are not you know, formal investors, to all chip in together and build up a stronger seed round across multiple people. Um, there's a couple of differences between angel investors, venture capitalists, crowdfunding. Is everyone roughly familiar with different types of investments and that kind of thing? Cool. So, at least the way I see it, angel investors are traditionally early stage companies, so at MVP stage or maybe just before MVP stage. Relatively low amount because you're limited by what that one person is willing to put in. And then on the other end of the scale, you've got venture capitalists, which are more late stage companies in startup terms. Uh, they've got obviously lots to throw at it, but it makes them more geared towards um, Series A. And definitely when we were speaking to VCs, we felt that on one hand they got the idea and they liked it, but we weren't quite polished enough for them. And they, they were pushing us to sort of get that polish and to answer some questions. But, you know, early stage company, there's some things that you just can't answer honestly about your revenue model in the next three years and what your lifetime customer value is going to be and that sort of thing. So if you're a bit early stage and you've only been test marketing so far, it's very hard to actually fit into the VC box. And so you're going to want to look at either angels or crowdfunding in order to get that. And crowdfunding, on the other hand, they do small raises. So the sort of sub SEIS style, 50 grand here and there. And they also do really large rounds as well. So Brewdog, Brewdog is currently raising on Crowdcube, which they're calling like the largest round ever. Multi-million pound deal. So it's up there with what VCs would do. And that's just something about the range of things that crowdfunding offers. There's three main companies, as far as I can see, in the UK that do equity-based crowdfunding. Two types of crowdfunding, you've got equity-based and sort of product or perk-based. So the ones you hear the most about are typically things like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, where you're essentially pre-ordering a product. So a company's got an idea or they've got a prototype, they want to get investment to put it out there, and they're asking early adopters to pre-order it for them. Equity crowdfunding, <coughs> you're not giving them the product, you're giving people equity in your idea in the same way you would do to angel investors or anyone else. And something I didn't realise until we launched was this doesn't take place in America. They're really behind on this. They don't have an equivalent of equity-based crowdfunding. Uh, their laws actually don't allow it. They don't allow what they call solicited investments in private companies. So we can't take US investors, for example. We've had to turn down people for it. But it also means you've got this really interesting market coming on in the UK. So you've got Cedars and Crowdcube, which are two of the larger ones. And you've also got Syndicate Room. Cedars, Crowdcube and Syndicate Room occupy slightly different spaces in the market. Cedars tends to be the least stringent, as far as I can see. Uh, they don't require full forecasts or a business plan to get listed. They just want the stuff that's going on your pitch page. They tend to get more casual investors. So if you go on Cedars, you're going to get a lot of sub-100 pound amounts. And you're going to get it from people who are sort of amateur investors or just people who are quite interested in your product. Um, when people invest through Cedars, I think the way it works is people come on and the equity they receive is actually all held by Cedars in a sort of trust equivalent sort of thing. Whereas Crowdcube is the next step up, um, we've had to go through a fairly stringent vetting process, so getting our business plan signed off, some guys going through our financials and analysing the valuation. Uh, but it also means that you tend to get higher net worth individuals registering on it. So we've, we've had £10 here and there, but also on our first day of launching, we had a guy put 20 k in without even reading the business plan. He just read our, well, watched our video and seemed to like it, so that was cool. Cedars and Crowdcube have about a 50% success rate. So once you get listed on the site, you've roughly got a 50% chance of actually securing your target. Syndicate Room are interesting. They have an 86% success rate, but they're also the most stringent. What they do differently to Crowdcube is they mandate that you've got a single cornerstone investor before you list who puts in at least 25%, who will also act as a board member representative for the other investors. So the idea would be, if you have got an angel investor, as we discussed in the slide before, who wants to put money in but can't put enough in to do your round, he can be your cornerstone and he can come on through Syndicate Room and it basically encourages the other people on there to invest as well. And that's uh, exclusively high net worth people investing through Syndicate Room, uh, but it's one that's probably worth trying out if you do have contact with a cornerstone investor. I'm going to move on to tips in a little bit, just little bits that I've learned over the last 
two weeks, I guess. But I wanted to just talk about a few myths or things, a few things that we heard a lot about crowdfunding for people telling us not to do it. Um, it's definitely not an easy way to get funding. We've been at it, we've been launched for two weeks, but we had about a four month period before that, just getting everything in order. So we've worked with Grant Thornton to actually produce the accounts and evaluation, probably spoken to about five or six separate specialists from Crowdcube's team, 50 page, bit, 50 page business plan, pitch video, pitch deck, all of your text needs to be referenced on the page. So you, you're writing stuff on your website that says something like, we expect the market size to increase by 50% in the next 12 months. Obviously you need to reference that, you need to find the Financial Times link or some sort of industry report. But then I also put on that when we first released Sign Up, the people in my year were uh, overwhelmed by how useful it was and they wanted us to reference that and I wasn't quite sure how to do it aside from getting a picture of someone smiling like, yay. <laughs> but we just, we managed it in the end. Should have put that slide on slightly after. Anyway, um, what makes it difficult about crowdfunding is it's, Maybe it will change eventually into a, a market where you list it on there and you've got these regular investors who swoop in and look at your product. But most of the investment we've secured so far, and I'm pretty sure this is standard for most companies, has come from our own networking and our own leads. Um, we've had a few substantial amounts from people on Crowdcube who we don't know, but uh, I'd say about 70% of it has been just through our own networking. And you can sort of tell this. So this is just a small snap uh, sort of snapshot of the different investors that we've got. And this is a really non-scientific way of doing this, but it'll give you an idea. Only one person's actually put their profile picture on there. The rest of these look like new accounts that have only been open since seeing our pitch. So there's actually very few... Crowdcube has 200,000 registered investors, but most of these accounts are driven by individual companies getting their friends, family, personal contacts to sign up, and then they don't go back onto the site regularly. So I guess the main point there is you're not, it's not that you launch something on crowdfunding and suddenly everyone sees it. Crowdcube to us has been more of just a central platform and a mechanism for actually handling the investments and registering interests and displaying the video, as opposed to actually being a marketplace and a forum. I guess that's different on syndicate room, right? Yes, it would be. Yeah, so the, your cornerstone investor will be who you brought in, and then syndicate room seems to have a much more uh, tight, smaller but more tightly focused community of people who regularly invest. Yeah. I don't know why tip six is there, but let's go for it. So there's a bunch of different investor types. Uh, most of you will know this. These aren't official categories. These are ones just that I've sort of people tend to fall into these blocks and it's really hard to write a perfect business plan or a perfect pitch deck when you're crowdfunding because you're not focusing it on one person. If you're preparing a presentation for a particular VC firm or a particular angel, you can get an idea of what that person's interested in and you can sort of look at companies they've invested in in the past and all that sort of thing. With crowdfunding, everyone's going to see it. You're going to get sort of accountants, finance types who are going to approach your business plan at a very different, in a very different way. You get some sort of um, entrepreneurial or just other types of people who are very much about the team and then other people who are about the idea. You're never going to produce something that satisfies everyone. So I'd say the number focused people generally need to be reassured. They want to know that at a very minimum they're going to get their money back and they want to know they're going to get some sort of healthy returns over the future. On the other hand, you've got the people who want to be really excited. They want to feel like they're not just investing in something that's going to get them 1.5 return over the next 12 months, but something that could be the next Facebook, Airbnb, Uber, or something that can have a real social impact. So we're an education platform, which is good because things with a social impact tend to do quite well on crowdfunding because it's, it's much easier to talk about on social media. It gets shared quite a bit. Um, but yeah, just different types and it, it ties into how you build your funnel for crowdfunding. If you just throw out all of your information at people, they're going to get overwhelmed with the, the amount of information you're putting at them and I think it tends to lead to a lower follow-up rate. So what we tend to do is we've got a fairly short pitch summary, fairly short video. If people like that, they can request our business plan. For the business plan, we actually send them our pitch deck, which is fairly standard in just 20 slides. And then we have a chat with them. If they specifically want to see the full forecast or the business plan, we'll send it to them. 
but most people actually don't want that level of information and we don't want to throw it at them and especially a business plan and financial forecasts where if you're not an accountant or experienced in this sort of thing you might it might put you off investing because you feel that you're clearly out of your depth so yeah strike a good balance on the amount of information that you're actually throwing out to people try and get on the phone to people as soon as possible because then you can actually present your passion for it you can answer their questions in a much direct way and you get a feel as to which of these types they are, so you can tailor your pitch a bit more. This is one that we learned after we paid our PR company, which was a pain. But um, th sometimes you get these stories that just sort of blow up around um, Kickstarter campaigns or around Cedars campaigns. And you'd think that there's a big media appetite for crowdfunding in general. I mean, even what we're doing. So I don't like to play on the fact that we're medical students doing this too much, because I just think it's a bit um, tacky and it sort of undermines it but we thought there would be at least a media appetite for the fact that we're doing it it's actually fairly difficult to do at the moment and I think the media is probably a bit oversaturated with the whole um, students create startup or just anyone creates startup crowdfunding sort of thing so probably don't rely too much on that unless your product's got a, a really specific angle that you can work into a, a current topical thing in the press so what we're doing at the moment is because we're basically talking about improving study habits. We're tying in what we do to the whole smart drug, modafinil sort of craze at the moment, whereby lots of students are taking uh, prescription drugs in order to focus more, and we're presenting ourselves as an alternative to that. But that's just a bit of luck, really, that we're able to tie into that story at the moment. Has anyone heard this argument or thought this argument? No? Well... A few people. I put it as a myth. It's probably not a total myth. I just think it's played up a bit too much. Crowdfunding's really new, especially equity-based crowdfunding. And we've not seen companies go on the full cycle yet. And of course, if you ask VCs, would you rather have a company that's had done crowdfunding and it's got all of these investors in it, or would you rather not do that? They'd rather not do it because they don't want their <laughs> control and extra equity taken out of the company. But at the end of the day, if you are too early stage for venture capitalists and you require a larger seed round than one angel investor is going to do you. You take crowdfunding and you manage to scale your company to the point where it's ready for a series A and you're, you've got your product market fit that Hannah talked about and you're ready to launch it in the States. I really don't think they're going to turn you down for the sake of like 12 or 15% that other investors have put into your company. And a lot of the smaller amount investors, sort of the 50, 100 pounds here and there, they're likely to want to get a return as soon as possible anyway. So if you're giving them a three to five times return on your Series A, I'd say about a majority of your crowdfunding investors are going to accept a buyout deal at that stage. So it's not something that I worry about too much. I'm quite happy to let this one play out over the next few years and let some companies that are a bit ahead of us sort of you know, figure out what that path looks like. Going to move on to some tips, but if anyone's got any like questions, comments at this stage, Anna? Um, just going to say with the Ignite one, we thought there was like tw uh, 12 angel investors involved. Sure. And uh, to complete this investment, they all had to sign up to the investor agreement, which meant we had to have signatures off all of them. So, how is, the, how is it structured legally? Like, surely you, if you crowdfund, you wouldn't have to get a signature off every person. On the new investor agreement, does that make sense? You How sort of do. So when you do Cedars, that's when you typically have, I, I would say, maybe 500 investors. And that's where, so Cedars will invest and they sort of keep an internal database of how much shares everyone's got. So you've just got the one investor, really. Ah, so you just deal directly with Cedars. Yeah. Ah, so that's because okay. Cedars tends to be like the net worth stuff. But Crowdcube yeah. is individual investors. Yeah. So you can set a limit as to what your A and your B shares are. So we give A shares when people invest five grand. Anyone else gets uh, B shares. And they've got their own, um, I, I guess, modified versions of the standard um, shareholders docs. So for example, okay. it's in our docs that we can do all the corporate governance stuff by email. And people have got seven de working days to respond. Otherwise, their vote is lost on that. Yeah. We'll probably, uh, I think the average pitch ends up with about 60 to 100 investors on Crowdcube. Probably only 10 of those are actual A shareholders. Um, with, the, with the email corporate governance stuff, I personally don't see it's going to be a problem. Yeah. But ask me in a year and maybe I'll be <laughs> tearing my hair out. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. You mentioned that um, you, you, you're trying to capitalise on this, um, the, this uh, the, the interest in the learning drugs and everything else. 
What about the, uh, and there's been a bit of a backlash uh, against um, brain training. Now, it, it, you're probably going to make a, a, a strident argument that it's not that. Um, but people might want to, me might want to characterise it as that. Mm -hmm. Has that been a problem? Yeah, I wouldn't, s it's, we've been careful to differentiate ourselves from that. Because I think the actual brain training stuff, so you're talking about luminosity and yeah. those kind of things, they're really popular and they, they charge ridiculous amounts for it. I think luminosity was something that you can pay £300 one off. So they're clearly aiming at like more the executive markets and that kind of thing. My problem with the brain training is on two things. First off, they're similar to us in the sense that they are based on some scientific research coming out of it. They're different to us because we've actually got a lot of the research. They, they usually cite one particular Swedish study that was sponsored by the brain training industry and then they've selected the data from it. It's not actually been shown to improve performance. Mm. So when you go on brain training, your performance on the brain training things improves, just in the same way that your performance in anything improves if you do it. But they've not actually managed to boil that down to an improvement in work or study performance or uh, IQ or any other sort of real measure. Well, IQ is not real, a real measure. It doesn't seem to boil down to anything. Whereas what we're doing is using techniques that help things get into your long-term memory. So there's something called spaced repetition, there's forgetting curves where you can track how likely someone is to have forgotten a certain piece of information over time. And we're basically just sending them that content along with some other personalization. Right now we've got anecdotal evidence uh, from myself. I use the product for my own studies and from our other users. What we'd like to do though is partner with some academics so we can see you know, how much it's improving exam scores mm -hmm. and that kind of thing over time. That was a roundabout way of doing it. Would that roughly answer your question? Yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, I'm just putting myself in your shoes and, and being, you know, seeing, see, as I said, it's, it's not as if it's on the front page of the mirror or the, you know, the, the red tops or anything like that. But in some of the, uh, the uh, new, uh, new scientists in Scientific America, sure. it's popping up in there. And as you said, it's, it's the, the, these brain training uh, techniques are, are training you so far as a, a set thing, but it's not like learning to speed read. Mm. You get a measurable thing from that that has general applications. Yes. Whatever you yeah. read, it works. Um, but, I mean, you've just said you're going to be citing this, that, and the other, and, and thinking about, I'm a venture capitalist. Come on, look, guys, I want science. I want hard science. I don't want anecdotal evidence. Mm. I, want, I, I want, you know, I want scientific evidence that says to me, this, this damn thing works. Yeah. No, sure. I think it's a good idea. We should try and, like, maybe push it into new scientists and stuff. We've, basically, we've got the studies that, prove it, there's not been studies done on sign up, but there's studies done on the general techniques that we use. So space repetition, active practice, peer learning, and those sorts of things. So we've no doubt that by just incorporating them into a mobile app, we're just increasing the accessibility of these techniques. So previously to do space repetition, you'd have to keep a deck of flashcards and sort them into boxes yourself and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, definitely over the next six months or so, we'd really like to test this in some sort of randomized, controlled way. Um, Duolingo do similar stuff by partnering with universities, putting one class on Duolingo, one class on non-Duolingo. And yeah, we'd definitely like to build that up basically. Yeah. Good question. Anyone else? Oh, cool. Uh, first tip, prepare for a three or four month process um, between sort of starting planning and actually getting your funds in. It's it's a really long process compared to what we initially thought. Uh, so actually submitting your pitch to Crowdcube takes about 28 days by the time you've built up your financial figures, then adopted those into their slightly strange snapshot format. Also building up your business plan and making sure that's referenced and everything. Due diligence, oh sorry, pitch video and stuff's got to go on that as well. Then you've got to reference claims in your pitch video. Then you've got to build up your pitch tech. There's a lot of stuff to do. Due diligence is basically they're going to go over your valuation to make sure it's roughly right. Um, they're going to check that you've referenced everything properly and there's just a lot of back and forth that comes on this. It's, we thought that we'd do this in a lot quicker time, but there's just certain things that come up that mean you, you might shave a week off it, but there's not much else in terms of flexibility. What like, valuation mechanism do you use? So we, it's really hard, obviously, early stage companies and all of that. We went with a 1.2 million valuation based on the fact that we've actually got about 50,000 users at the moment. Uh, me and other people on the team have uh, 
started and sold companies before, so we've got a bit of experience. We've got some interest from potential B2B clients. And yeah, that was a figure that sort of came up with working with Grant Thornton and then going to Crowdcube's analysts. So it was a uh, multiple of revenue projections or? No, not at this stage, because we've not fully worked out the revenue model. Um, we've got three areas of revenue that we're looking to go from. So we've got the freemium side of things. We've got professional content and then we've got institutional licenses. And we've mapped these out and we, we're quite confident we can get 66,000 in in year one and then 217 in year two. But we're still very much trying to get some of the product market fit down and we're not sure, what, we're not sure what's going to happen over the course of this year. So we're more basing it on the future potential of something like this. It, in terms of sign up, it could be a go-to sort of educational app store almost. So people writing quizzes who are lecturers and then distributing them across the world, integrating MOOCs, working with corporates. It's really hard to value that stuff, but at the end of the day, we just sort of went with a figure that we thought gave good value to investors. We looked at a competitor who is a bit ahead of us in a different market, who currently mm -hmm. just closed a Series A valuation on 6 million. They've got 250,000 users who are all free. We've got 50,000, so it sort of lines up that way. Mm -hmm. But as for why we went to 1.2 and not 1.25 or 1.1, couldn't especially tell you. And not five either. Sorry? Not, not five. Not five, well, I mean, it could be 1.1 or, or could have even been higher, right? Or? It could. I mean, I think you've got, uh, you've got quite a large scope of, like, a grey area when you're valuing something like this. So. Clearly, if we valued ourselves at 2.5 million, that would have been more than higher end of the spectrum. That would have been a bit absurd, really. And if we'd have valued it at 0.5, that would have also been way too low. Within that, you've just got this whole scope of, you know, how do you really do it? But either way, with 1.5, we feel that we've, we can definitely deliver a, a return. Because all we need to do to get to Series A, really, is we've not actually got the product out there yet. We've got an old version of the product. We need to release a new version, grow the user base to something around 150, 200,000 users, prove that we can get 2 to 5% of people paying for it in a specific area, and then we're already in a better stage than our current competitor um, who target primary schools and secondary schools. So, yeah, based on that, really, more than happy to chat about that in a bit more detail later if you want, mm -hmm. when I've got my spreadsheets up. <laughs> um, 30 days to actually get your pitch in. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. And then it takes about 28 days to go through anti-money laundering, due diligence for investors, sending them the shareholders documents and that kind of thing. And one tip, HMRC will give you an advance assurance of your SCIS or EIS status uh, if you apply for it. Being HMRC, it takes them about six weeks to send it. So if you're thinking about doing something like this, apply for that well in advance because you'll need it when you're actually running your actual pitches live to show investors that they can be confident of getting their 30 or 50% tax breaks. Uh, tip two, look at other pitches and learn from them. There seem to be three different types of pitches on Crowdcube in, the, in terms of the trajectory that they follow. There's some that launch and just absolutely smash it on the first day. They get to about 80 or 90% after 24 hours. These are rare. They're usually sort of like a celebrity chef or someone who's got a lot of clout that they can get, you know, hundreds of thousands of people putting 100 quid in. So unless anyone's a celebrity chef here, move yourself out of that category. Then you've got ones who are sort of in the middle in that they keep up with their targets and they're roughly where you'd expect them to be each week, uh, maybe a little bit ahead. And that's where we are at the moment. Key thing in this would be just keep your momentum going. So even if, you're get, if you get a £10 investment, it jumps you to the top of the queue that people see, and it also makes you more likely to be listed on the homepage as the most recent investment or as a popular pitch. So just try and keep your momentum going fairly steadily over the course of the 30 days. And then you get ones that start off and just nothing really happens. Uh, so these are guys called eSign who are currently on Crowdcube, by looking at the pitch, there's nothing obviously wrong with it in terms of like other companies on the site that they're better or worse than. It's just that they've been stuck there pretty much since they launched. And I think it's just a trap that if you go a week without getting any investment or your target moving up, it starts to make other people think, ooh, why is anyone else invested? 
then you get this sort of feedback loop until eventually you're stuck. Their business plan might be awesome, but no one's going to read it because it, they're sort of put off even before they get to that stage. So have some people lined up who can give you a bit of an injection if you need it at some point. Leads on to the next point. So syndicate room mandate this. You've got to get 25%. Crowdcube heavily recommend it anyway. Have 20 to 30% of your investment, preferably 30%, lined up off-site so that when you launch, you can, um, you're not looking like an empty bar, basically. And you've got people who will look at it and think, oh, well, at least someone's invested. I might as well invest. Because um, it, it just gives you social proof recently. I chose that picture because does anyone know what the significance of it is? There was a social experiment a while ago. They basically asked a guy to stand on a street corner and stare at the sky like that. When it's one person staring at the sky, everyone just thinks he's crazy and walks past him. You get three or four people and everyone just assumes that there must be something really great to look at in the sky and they start doing it as well. And that's pretty much what you need to do in your pitch. You need to get some in so that people look at it and they don't think, well, he's on 0%, so if even this guy's mum isn't putting it in, why should I risk my money? Regular exciting updates for investors. So we try and do two updates a week um, during our pitch. And you know, some of these are just saying that we've hit a certain investment target. Sometimes it's little partnerships that we've made with people that we've come in contact with, releasing new demos or screenshots of the app and that kind of thing. Uh, people will follow your pitch and they will get email notifications when you give them an update. So it just, if you've got an update, it not only shows them that you're actively doing stuff and that the company's progressing, but it just gives you an excuse to appear in their inbox at an extra time and it drives it to the front of their mind. Um, if you're doing something like this, it's going to consume all of your time and it's going to be the thing that you sort of wake up thinking about, the thing that you go to sleep thinking about, and then every point in between. And so you tend to assume that other people are always as excited about it as you. I remember I was speaking to a friend of mine. I was thinking, oh, he's not got back to me. He said he was going to put a grand in. I chased him up after a few days and I was sort of thinking... Has he read the plan? He just doesn't like it. Is he? Is he not got the money? He just forgot, and I, it, I could not even fathom the fact that someone could forget about this because surely this is the most exciting thing going on in his life. No, he's got kids and a family and a job and all of that other stuff. So just have some updates which you can use to bring your company back to people's attention. I couldn't find decent pictures for these ones, so text only. Um, strike the right balance of information. I think I've talked about this earlier, basically, but don't overload people. Just give them enough to get them hooked and try and get on the phone with them as soon as possible because no matter how detailed your business plan is, there's certain bits of it you can only get across in person and it's really helpful for people to actually like, hear your voice and the enthusiasm when you're speaking about it, especially for angel investors and these non-traditional investors. They want to, generally, they're focused on the team and the person. So they really want to hear that coming through. Uh, set up physical events to promote your campaign. Um, there's an obvious reason for this, which is it's a great way to meet people and to get a social media buzz and get people talking about your product. Great way to ask questions. And the slightly more subtle way is definitely on Crowdcube, they like the fact that they can put on physical events. So if you've got an event coming up, they will put you in their newsletter almost guaranteed each week. Um, so even if you put on an event that only one or two people come down to and it's just you having a pint with some accountant who is also an investor, you've also gone out on their mailing list, so you've driven a few thousand extra people to your pitch. Um, Roy, thank you for putting us in touch with the Google people because we did an event for like 50 people that cost us 120 quid. We just got the Google, Google garage space for free, went down to Costco, grabbed some wine and put it out for people and I've still got about four bottles left at home, so it probably costs us £100 overall. Use your personal network, but don't abuse it. Um, your friends will generally be really excited for you that you're doing this sort of thing, and some might get a bit annoyed that you're sort of clogging up, especially on Facebook, that you're like clogging up their feed of cat videos and whatever else with your business stuff. So th there's a way of sort of telling people what you're doing and getting people interested without just sort of plugging people for money. And it has a huge difference. We've had some really fantastic leads just from my Facebook network. And my Facebook is mostly sort of students, so not, you wouldn't necessarily expect it, but then you don't know what people's parents do or who they sort of knew from their internship at KPMG or whatever. So you definitely want people to know about it. So, um, there's just 
I just thought this was interesting. There's all sorts of reasons why this could have been different, but I posted this, which was just very basic sign out, and everyone's like, oh, fuck, James is talking about his bloody app again. Four likes. And then I did a slightly different one a few days later, which was, it was, had my personality in it. I was, I was clearly excited. Uh, I was thanking everyone for either putting their tenors in already or just for sort of uh, using the app, downloading it, telling their friends about it and that sort of thing. Uh, I got 73 likes, two shares, eight comments. Um, obviously a lot more exposure for us, but it also shows that when you attach your personality into something on Facebook, you're clearly going to annoy people a lot less as well. Numbers game, you'll get thousands of pitch views every day, you'll get about 10 business plan requests every day, you'll get hundreds of people sharing it. In terms of that boiling down to people investing, it's really low. It's one of the lowest sort of conversion rates you'll, you'll see online because there's such a big barrier to doing it. So just to view the pitch video on Crowdcube, you've got to register an account, you've got to certify yourself as either a high net worth, an everyday investor or an experienced investor. To actually invest money, even if it's a tenor, you've got to read some information and then answer five questions on the risks of investing in early stage companies. And if that doesn't put you off, <laughs> nothing will, because it's sort of like basically just really deliberately telling people that most companies fail, you won't get dividends, you probably won't be able to get your shares back. So there's a lot of drop off on this funnel. You just want to go for as many people as you can. US and Canada cannot invest through the site, which is a real pain. Um, this is because of US laws. We had a Harvard professor of innovation who wanted to put 10 grand into sign up, but he was put off by the fact that he'd have to get an attorney to go through his own accounts and sign a document saying that he was worth at least a million dollars and that he had an income of at least $200,000 a year. Then he'd have had to send that and his ID. It, it was just not worth it for him. I was embarrassed to even ask the guy to even go through this process. Um, yeah, so high barriers to actually getting the investment in. Do throw everything at your pitch marketing. So we actually got one of our investors to put money in directly to us rather than going through Crowdcube so that we'd have about 10 or 12 grand to play with the marketing. Um, we've done uh, PR, we're doing the updates, I'm guest blogging for anyone who will have me. If you've got a blog, I will talk about this sort of stuff or something else that you want me to. Um, offline networking, just around Leeds and London. On-site promotion, Crowdcube will promote you to an extent. They, ironically, they tend to promote you when you're almost certainly going to get the funding anyway. So I was like, oh, can we go out in the newsletter? Yeah, when you get to 80%, I won't need you then. But yeah, they'll do it anyway. Social media, so LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, obviously. This is an obvious one, but it's not so obvious why. So Crowdcube can't list your business plan on the site. Firstly, you don't want your business plan being totally public. You might have a competitor who wants to see it or someone else you don't want getting involved. So they've got to manually request it from you. When you get these requests through, reply to them as soon as possible because most of these are like their impulse decisions. And if you lose that wave of enthusiasm, you don't know when they're going to get around to looking at it again. Whereas if you hit them within five or 10 minutes and they're still infused about it, I almost always get a reply instantly saying, oh, hi, James, I'm interested in product because of this. And then you've, you're one step further along the sales funnel with them and you've made that personal contact. Otherwise, it's just getting buried in their inbox and I'd say you hear back from about like five or ten percent of people. Progress on crowdfunding isn't linear. Um, you, you'd be tempted to think you've got four weeks, so I need 25 percent here, 25 here, 25. But you're going to have a slow start, which you can catalyze by getting your pre-arranged investors to put in early. Once you get to about 30 percent, you're at least looking respectable. Then you should have a fairly quick acceleration, or you should aim to get a quick acceleration up to about 75 or 80 percent. And this is when everyone knows it's almost a certain thing for it to happen. Once you get to 75 percent, 92 percent of businesses do get funded. So all of these investors who are on the fence about it, sudden, and the people who are going to wait till day 27, 28 to put in, suddenly they've realised that, OK, I need to put in now because if this guy gets one more significant investment, I'm going to lose out on my chance to do it. What happens if you're oversubscribed? 
You can do overfunding, actually. Right. So you most have to give away more equity, or you can fix the equity more more of equity. Right. Yeah. So we we will do some overfunding if we can. So we've got 180 is our target, and that's that's the minimum amount. So if we get to 179, we don't get any of it because that's the amount we've said we need to execute our strategy. But yeah, we're going to overfund by releasing a bit extra equity that just lets us be a bit more extravagant with the marketing and the, have a bit more slippage and that kind of thing. <coughs> yeah, so going back on the non-linear thing, uh, stage one is your zero to 30%. You want to get to 30% as soon as possible. Uh, just, and also try and have 40% lined up if possible because there's always a friend who is, yes, I'm definitely going to invest right up until the point that they don't. So there's always going to be a few people who sort of drop through. 30 to 75%, this is the bulk of your campaign, and this is where you want to do most of your marketing. Don't do your marketing here, because you're going to waste a lot of your ammo, because people who otherwise would have invested are going to look at your page and think, oh, it's empty, I'm not going to do it. Most of your marketing here. This is a stage that we're at now, we're about 300 quid off getting to 75%. Once we get to 75, we're going to start sort of really following people up, saying, look, now's your chance, you don't want to miss it. Um, can I speak to you on the phone? Can I come and meet you? And that sort of thing. Then stage four is your overfunding, which is up to you, but most businesses tend to do it, I think. Um, yeah. This sounds a bit patronising, but uh, you just, be, just be honest with people. You've, you've got 200,000 investors on Crowdcube and you need about 100 of them to invest. Some people aren't going to like your idea. Some people are going to disagree with your revenue figures or uh, your marketing or whatever else. Don't try and like... If you don't know the answer to something, if someone's asking you what do you think your year three, quarter three projections are going to be, as a startup, the, ans the only honest answer is I haven't got a bloody clue, to be honest with you. It'll be somewhere between here and here. But just explain that to people, because most people, they're not incredibly savvy investors. They, they might be an accountant, for example, and they're used to evaluating later stage businesses, so they'd expect that level of information. But yeah, just don't be afraid to say that you don't know, and the, the reasons why you don't know are because the startup market is so volatile in a sense that you wouldn't really want to put a figure on it at this stage. Most people are quite happy with that. Some people don't get it, but then they probably weren't the sort of investor that you needed and you don't want them coming back to haunt you a few years down the line when you're five pounds out of what you said you were going to be and yeah. Related thing, know when to adapt to feedback and when to stand your ground. Uh, you're going to get suggestions from people. You're going to get suggestions from people who are in your market or are entrepreneurs themselves or investors and they're going to want to suggest things about your marketing strategy, about the branding of your business and whatever. And again, it's advice that in a lot of contexts you will probably pay for, but you're going to get so much of it that if you listen to everything, your startup's going to go from this sort of really refined, great idea that you had into a horse designed by committee with little bits tacked on here and there, and you're going to lose your vision at a really early stage. Having said that, some ideas are really good, and as much exposure as we've got to sign up before we launched, since launching, We've just had loads and loads of input from people. We actually reduced the valuation slightly, so we started on a 1.5, which we knew was sort of the higher end of the spectrum. We got a number of people investing at that stage, but we got a number of people actually saying, actually, this is a little bit high. I think it's high because compared to these guys and blah, blah, blah. So we did listen to that change, and since we've done that, that's what let us shoot up from about 60 to 74% where we're at now. It doesn't count until it's in. Um, no matter how much people say that they're going to invest, just don't bank on anything until it's actually in. And you'll develop, if you're not already, you'll develop the skill of like politely nudging people um, to get it in. If it's your friends, you can quite honestly say, look, we really need to get to this target now. Uh, it would really help us out if you could put your money in. Um, for other people, obviously, it's more difficult. It's why you want to get to, you want to do announcements when you're at something like 50% or 75%. Because then your email isn't, please, can you invest in my company? It's, look, we're moving really fast. I would like you to be a part of this round because you've asked some good questions about the company, but ticked up. Some cool resources, and th there's loads. I don't want to tell people you've got to use these, but anyone heard of the Growth Accelerator Programme until I mentioned it? 
cool. Growth Accelerator is just the really awesome. So they do a number of different uh, mentoring and advice things, but the one we used was for the finances. So we had a grant under Growth Accelerator, which is a UK government subsidised scheme. We got four days of time from a Grant Thornton financial analyst for something like £400, which is obviously ridiculously cheap. Produced all of our P&L and revenue streams, cash flow with us, helped us on the valuation, um, helped us getting onto Crowdcube, and then put a grand of his own money into the platform. So we actually made a bit of a profit on that. Uh, Thunderclap, has anyone used? Uh, Thunderclap is a system where people sign up to your Thunderclap campaign and it will post out a social media message at a specific time and date so that rather than getting 100 people over a month to post about your product, you get everyone to blast it out at one time and then you hit the, you know, your community is talking about this sort of thing and you get it on LinkedIn and Facebook more. Um, so that, that was pretty good for us. I think that got us in front of about, well, it got 500,000 impressions and then it's hard to track what actually comes into your campaign from it but it definitely had more of an impact than if we'd have just done them singularly. Brand Yorkshire have an offer on. We got our video pitch video done for about 480 quid with that, and they also did a bit of social media promotion with that, so that was, that was really good, and it's, you know, it's, it's a professional-looking video. It easily stands up to the other ones on the site. And he put that money back into the campaign, actually, so I've hardly spent anything, so it's great. Um, Google Digital Garage and Costco for your launch events in Leeds uh, just worked really well for us. Did you? No? Cool. And so, yeah, that's basically my, sort of, I guess, tips so far on crowdfunding. Um, sign up, we're 74% funded, raising 180,000 overall to change the face of education. Uh, you can become a shareholder from £10 if you're interested. Uh, feel free to come and chat to me, I'll come and grab a drink afterwards. And my contact details are there. Thank you.